Can you guys hear me pretty well? Yeah. Yeah, you sound great. And that's a, a fun background. Michael, have you met Amy? Can we introduce you to Amy? Yes. Oh, you probably did meet her when you did your, yeah. You did my YouTube presentation. Great. Oh, here comes the cyclist. I live in a neighborhood where one of the big group rides comes through. Uh, if you can, you may, you may be able to even hear them in the background. There'll be sometimes, you know, 70 or 80 cyclists together coming down our street. Oh, wow. Where do you live? Uh, in Arden. So in where? Arden neighborhood, just north of Broad Ripple. Oh, okay. But right in the North Shore of uh, the White River. Yeah. Our street goes along that, and our street's just been paved recently, so they they come flying through. That's a lot of cyclists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a lot, yeah. Yeah, I join them now and then. <laughs> I do a lot of cycling. Yeah. How how many miles do they cover when they're doing that? Uh, it depends on the group. Uh, there's there's the elite group on today. What's today? Wednesday. So Monday, Wednesday, and then Tuesday, Thursday. Usually in these evening rides, twenty five or thirty miles. Oh. That's a good number. I did that when I was younger, when I was living in D.C. I belonged to, to a group and had a lot of fun doing that. And Friday night, you used to have what were called beer runs. <laughs> you had to be really careful. I'm going to admit all. And after I say welcome, Betty, go ahead and take it away. Mm -hmm. And I'll be sharing my screen. Great. I, welcome. I have some slides. Good evening. Welcome to the Zoom room. Deborah Myers, I see your picture. You are an active participant with us. I love it. If we were live, I'd actually get to meet you. It is wonderful to see, to see Jeb and Carol again. Thank you so much for coming. I do miss, I miss seeing you. The board would be doing some brain crunching this summer to determine how we are going to go forward. We we feel that so many people have enjoyed the Zoom because we can reach out and we 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 have people join us who are from not just from central Indiana or the Indy area, which is great. And we can reach out with our speakers as well. But we might want to see how we might also mix it up a little bit and try to see if we could have more than an opportunity or two for a, um, a live engagement. Well, we enjoy it here uh, in Pennsylvania. Now, who, who is that? Whose voice did I, I just hear? I'm Mary Lou and Mary Lou Burton, and I'm at Pennsylvania in Pennsylvania. Okay, and Where Mary Lou, how did you? How did you? Uh, that's wonderful. I, in fact, I was just telling uh, Michael Snodgrass, who has presented for us in previous years, as I said, you know, you'll, you'll hear it tonight. There'll be somebody from somewhere and it's not going to be Zionsville. They're going to be from quite a distance. So how did you hear about us? Well, uh, uh, Louise Little uh, purchased our Great Decision books through the Indiana Council. And oh. that's how we heard about you. <laughs> I don't know who Louise Little is. Should I know? Oh, she's, she's the head of our, our Great Decisions group. I live at uh, Ware Presbyterian Village in Oxford, Pennsylvania, near the Maryland border. So, okay. so it, it, have you been attending a while or is this your first time this evening? Uh, no, I've attended some other ones. There you so, are, Mary. Yeah. I see your name now. Yeah. Yeah. Have you enjoyed them? Oh, yes. Yes. They're very, very uh, good. That's that's why I'm here again. <laughs> you know, I, I should explain for those. Um, we, uh, uh, those of us on the board, are just have a few years of history on the board. Uh, the Great Decisions, of course, goes back decades. It is America's oldest, longest running uh, discussion forum in, in the country on just the matters we've talked about, matters of, of uh, global issues, uh, particularly as they might intersect with the United States. Um, and I think a lot of um, programs, a lot of great decision programs are through libraries, they're through churches, through all kinds of centers. 
Uh, I live in Lafayette and I know there's a group here in Lafayette, the Wabash Valley, something or another. And I was looking at their booklet of events and they've got great decisions. But what they do is they do take the video and they look at the video presentation of the speaker and they have the magazine and they read the article and they have a discussion among themselves. And I don't know how many councils around the country actually bring a speaker in like we've done, at least in my time on the board. And we bring the speaker in. We do have the, 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 the journal if people would like to have that. We'd like the speakers to at least you know, reflect some of their, their uh, presentation from that because um, people will have questions. And then we have what I have always pride, um, pridefully say, a robust Q&A. We have the 45 minute program that we have a robust Q&A, um, which means that the audience gets to engage. And I think people like that. I think they like having somebody come in and, and they still get to engage and talk back and forth. But that, uh, Mary Lou, do you find that uh, appealing? Does that appeal to you? That's what we do. Actually, we rearrange the book, um, the uh, way the uh, chapters fall according to your schedule <laughs> so that we can watch your programs and, oh, and yeah. combine it with a book. So, yeah. Well, I tell you. So, well, if we were giving prizes for someone coming farthest away, I'd have to hear somebody else who was coming farther from that's <laughs> prizes, but and we can't say you can come free next time because you can't anyway. Well, thank you. Thank you for speaking. Oh, you're up. welcome. Thank you so much. That's, that's a wonderful way to start our evening. Uh, you can't buy that type of marketing, <laughs> that kind of advertising. My name is Betty Tonzing, and I greet you uh, now for several weeks to the Indiana Council of World Affairs. You are uh, engaged now this evening with our Great Decisions series. And this evening, it is the rise of the left in um, Latin American politics. And I think this is something that many of us, particularly older, have been watching for quite some time. And there's, there's the um, uh, right-wing governments and left-wing governments and the conflict that this has occurred in, in Latin America, um, uh, all of this part of the Western hemisphere and how it's, what kind of, um, how long our interaction it has with us here in the middle section of the Americas. And uh, we have Dr. Michael Snodgrass, who is gonna be introduced uh, by Ray Montano. He is going to be um, um, doing an interaction with, uh, with Dr. Snodgrass for about 45 minutes and then uh, midway, we would then go into the public Q&A. And I think that we've had enough promo about who we are. Thank you again, Mary Lou. And I think with that, I will simply introduce uh, Ray, a fellow board member. Okay, thank you, Betty. Um, and again, welcome to, to everyone here tonight. Uh, we really do appreciate uh, everyone's attendance. Um, our uh, programs have been well attended for the past year and so we, we appreciate those of you who are returning to our programs and um, we really do appreciate the support that you've given us. Um, so it's my pleasure tonight to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Snodgrass who will speak on our, our topic tonight of uh, left-wing governments in Latin America. Uh, Dr. Snodgrass is a specialist in Latin American history and he currently serves as the director of IUPUI's uh, Global International Studies Program uh, in the School of Liberal Arts. And he is a uh, just recently been promoted to professor. So congratulations on that. Um, his research interests include US Latin American relations and history and the history of uh, Mexican immigration to the United States. He received his BA from the University of Iowa his master's from the University of Texas at Austin, and his PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. His academic interests include migration and labor issues in Mexico and the U.S. Alliance for Progress programs in uh, Chile and Brazil. He is a recipient of a, a Fulbright Hayes grant in 2007 and a Fulbright Garcia Robles uh, dissertation research fellowship from the United States Department State Department and Mexican Foreign Ministry from uh, 1994 to 1995. Dr. Snodgrass, Snodgrass is the author of Deference and Defiance in Monterey, Workers, Paternalism and Revolution in Mexico from 1890 to 1950, as well as uh, essays in anthologies and journals, including International Labor and Working Class History and Latin American Research Review. 
Michael, it's our, our pleasure to welcome you here tonight. Um, we're going to start out by letting Michael uh, give a presentation. And uh, if you have a question, we will open our questions up for, uh, for you to ask uh, after uh, Dr. Snodgrass has made his comments. If you would send me a, uh, a chat message through the chat room to Ray Montagno, I will kind of moderate the questions, make sure that people get to ask their questions in order. Uh, in the meantime, if you would keep yourself muted, we would appreciate that. And with that, Michael, it's all yours. Okay, thanks, uh, Betty and Ray, and uh, welcome everybody. As you can see, I'm coming to you from the crossroads of the Americas, Panama City. <laughs> That's my background. I thought that'd be appropriate, but I'm actually on the north side of Indianapolis. So, but it's it's nice weather here, just as it appears to be in in Panama City. And so, yeah, well, I'm going to talk a bit about um, I'll kind of my comments are going to reflect your uh, reading assignment <laughs> from the Great Decisions chapter by Jorge Castaneda. And as kind of Betty noted, you know, there was a time when uh, those of you of a certain generation would remember when you would pick up a newspaper and there would be a lot of news about Latin America. And um, that was back in the days when you'd actually pick up newspapers. <laughs> so some of, some of my students, that's an alien concept. But, you know, back in the 1980s, you'd pick up a New York, uh, uh, a New York Times or Washington Post and something about Latin America would be on the paper almost every day. Um, and that was a sign that things weren't going too well because <laughs> there was military dictatorships in South America and civil wars in, in Central America. Um, fortunately today, we don't maybe see as, and hear as much about Latin America because things are going um, uh, quite a bit better. And I'm gonna explain why um, over the course of this, this talk. So I'll begin by sharing a screen here of a um, PowerPoint. And I hope everybody can see that. You see that okay, Betty? Yeah, great. So here's our start and here's sort of the, um, so Jorge Castaneda is taking on the um, unenviable task of trying to explain tr political trends in all of Latin America. It's a, it's a challenge because Latin America is a very diverse um, region. And his focus in 2023 is on sort of the return of the political left um, in terms of some newly elected presidents all across the region, um, from Mexico all the way down to, to Argentina. Um, and so this image here in the slide shows some of those figures. And from, I guess, my left to your right, the guy starting with the guy in the glasses, depending upon how you're looking at it, that's the, um, um, the newest president of Chile, the youngest head of state um, in the world. He's, uh, I think he was 35 when he assumed office, uh, Gabriel Boric. Uh, next to him is the uh, president of his neighbor, Argentina. Um, behind him also with the, with the stylus glasses is the new president of Colombia. Um, uh, the first time that country ever elected a president who would be considered center left in, it, in its history. So some real big changes there. The guy with the kind of sour face in the bottom is our, 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 our friend, President Lopez Obrador from our good neighbors in Mexico. The guy next to him is the already deposed president of Peru. <laughs> Um, and the woman there is uh, the new president of, of Honduras, right? Another country that's recently kind of really experienced a real strong transition to, to, to full democracy. And I'll be honest, I don't know who the last person is, but I will say that notably absent from this image is uh, the newly inaugurated president of Brazil, the biggest country in Latin America, Luis Ignacio da Silva, um, who has been, um, who, who's starting his, will be his third term. Right? He was just reelected very narrowly. So so there's real, there's been a real resurgence of the left in Latin America, and I need to figure out how to advance my screen. There we go. So, and here's our author who took on that that task, Jorge Castaneda. Um, and I've done this, as Betty noted, I've done a few of these over the years um, when when Latin America becomes one of the chapters in the Great Decision series. Um, over the last recent years, I've done on U.S.-Mexican relations on China and Latin America and on um, uh, the war on drugs in Latin America was the last one I, I, I did for, for this audience. Um, and I will say of all those um, talks I've given, the best chapter I've been able to comment upon is the one by Jorge Castaneda. So the Great Decision Series really pulled off a coup by recruiting him to write this chapter. Um, he himself is a very prominent political scientist, um, 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 has a, have a number of publications, including this one here, one of, the, um, one of a slew of uh, biographies that came out on on Che Guevara in the late 90s. His is probably the most critical um, biography of, of, of Che Guevara. He's also written um, several books on you know, US-Latin American relations, 
which reflects his own role having been a foreign minister of Mexico. Um, and he's written a lot on really on the political left. So that's kind of his forte in terms of his academic scholarship. Um, but he himself is actually, he's, he's Mexican. Um, he's the son of a foreign minister. So his dad was Mexico's foreign minister during the 1970s, sort of in the heyday of the, the ruling party's uh, power and prestige. Mexico had just discovered a lot of oil then. It had a very independent-minded, um, very leftist foreign policy in the 70s, actually supporting a lot of rebel movements in Central America. So his dad was part of that, that, that moment in Latin American history and politics. And Mr. Castaneda himself, like a lot of uh, Mexicans of his class and generation, um, started out as a student involved in more radical politics. Um, in Mexico. And then over the years, he's kind of moved a little bit, become a little bit more conservative as happens. But in the in the 1980s, he became an advisor to the first real strong opposition candidate to run against the ruling party in 1988 in a very controversial election that the, uh, the ruling party won. Um, and then when the ruling party was finally defeated in 2000 by a guy named Vicente Fox, Mr. Fox named Jorge Castaneda as his foreign minister. So he he achieved a real notable position at, at that moment. So he, he has a really great chapter in that he's taken on the task of trying to explain the political trends across a very vast uh, region. And I think he does a great job at it because it's a real challenge. It would be more of a challenge maybe to do the similar things, say, for Africa, given the distinct history and culture and politics across that region, or maybe the Middle East. And the reason why is because the 20 or so countries of uh, the reason the region we call Latin America, a term which really took off around the early 1900s um, in terms of Latin Americans referring to themselves in that way. Um, one of the things is that there are some very common regional characteristics that we can define that make it easier to talk about the region as a whole when it comes to political trends. Um, among them would, of course, be um, the entire region's past history as colonies of the Iberian imperial powers. Portugal in the case of Brazil, and of course, Spain in the case of all of Spanish America. So that gave them a sort of uniformity in terms of having a common culture, um, dominant languages, of having a dominant religious faith of Christianity, um, which is by far the dominant faith in that region. There's no region in the world where the Catholic religion is more prominent than in Latin America. Um, one of the things that came out of those three or four centuries of colonial rule, four centuries in the case of Cuba, was that Latin America became uh, one of the world's great melting pots as a result of immigration and intermixing. So there's a lot of ethnic and racial diversity um, in Latin America. And of course, even after the colonial period, immigrants continued to arrive um, from parts of Europe and from the Arab world. Um, but one of the other things that those long years of colonial rule left was a very unique economic system. So the Portuguese and the Spanish per perceived their colonies as colonies that were going to produce agricultural and mining exports. Um, to markets in those days in Europe. And that's something that's gonna continue really in many ways to this, to this very day. So one common feature that many of these countries of Latin America share is a, you know, historically a strong dependence on foreign direct investments to promote economic development and a reliance on the exploitation of agricultural or extractive resources to global markets. Um, initially Europe, then the United States when its economy took off, um, and today, China. So a lot of countries like today, Brazil and Argentina, for example, now have China as their number one trading partner. Um, and they all still depend very heavily on the exportation of, you know, what we could call primary products of raw materials, be they extractive resources like minerals and oil, or a whole vast variety of agricultural products from soybeans to beef to sugar to coffee. Um, and in that regard, the Americas share this, even North America. The United States exports a lot of products like that. Canada is even more reliant on the exportation of raw material products like that. Interesting, the one exception to this would be our neighbor to the immediate South, Mexico, whose major exports today are um, cars, trucks, auto parts, and computers. So Mexico has achieved one of the goals that's long been shared by many Latin American countries of developing a more industrialized uh, uh, economy. And of course, it helps Mexico that is, that is proximus to the United States in a big market uh, where there's a demand for those, for those products. Um, so then some of the other things that would be common features, you know, would be that all of these countries more or less achieve their independence um, 
from Iberian colonial rule around the same time in the 1810s and the 1820s. They were the Spanish American countries were all established as democratic republics, um, at least on paper, um, with constitutions very similar to that of the United States. Um, and that wasn't a coincidence. Brazil was a little bit different in that Brazil was initially established in the 1820s as a constitutional monarchy. Uh, they called their government the Brazilian Empire until the 1880s when it was established as the Brazilian Republic that it is today with that, that, that beautiful famous flag um, that was crafted at that time. And then as many of you probably know, Cuba and Puerto Rico were outliers. Uh, Cuba was famously called you know, the, the ever loyal isle because it remained a Spanish colony until 1898 when the United States intervened in Cuba's long struggle for independence, defeated Spain, Cuba and Puerto Rico, they be, then became American possessions, Cuba for only four years, Puerto Rico uh, until this very day. <laughs> so that's a common characteristic, but the end of Iberian colonial rule didn't end the encounters with empire, of course. The British had a tremendous influence on Latin America's economic development and to a certain extent its culture, particularly in South America over the course of the 1900s, during the time when Britain built some, somewhat of an informal empire, not really meddling in the politics of countries like Argentina or Chile, but very much having a decisive influence on their, their economic development. Um, and of course, British immigrants arrived to countries like Argentina and Brazil, and they brought with them uh, a peculiar game that is known in Latin America as football or futebol in Brazil, we know it as soccer. And that's probably one of the great lasting legacies of that encounter with the British and Argentines are, are quite proud of the fact that they and not Britain have won the World Cup three times, including most recently in this past November. <laughs> and of course, more importantly, they had a lot of imperial encounters with the United States of America, um, something that begins um, early on in the case of Mexico, there's a war um, and would continue eventually in the early 20th century to affect all of Latin America, including Chile and Brazil. And this involved military encounters. It involved a lot of economic influence. So after World War I, the United States became the dominant um, investment investors in places as distinct as Cuba, Chile, and Argentina. And that economic influence is still very powerful today. But there's also a lot of cultural influence. You know, we, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the, the military and political interventions, but that cultural influence is going to become pervasive in that uh, Latin Americans are going to travel to the United States to attend universities and take some of that culture back with them. Um, by the 20th century, Latin Americans are going to be watching Hollywood films. Today, you go to Latin America and you turn on a TV and you can watch CNN or Fox News um, in a way that we don't see, for example, the news from Argentina or uh, or Mexico. So the influence is, is, is quite considerable um, uh, and it's an important part of their history. Another factor that then would distinguish Latin America from the United States is the political activism of the military, something that begins early on in the 19th century and would continue through the Cold War. Um, and what this means, of course, is that while established initially as democratic republics, democracy didn't always endure. Um, there's a long history of military interventions in the political life of Latin America and the creation of military dictatorships. Um, there's also a long history of um, military officers becoming playing a very important role in politics. We, we have that, of course, in the United States, too. We can think about presidents named like Grant and Eisenhower, but their political service came after the retirement from the military, whereas in Latin America, it's while they're still very active, and in many cases, the military is going to assume direct role over much of the political life of the nation. But the thing about the military is that oftentimes, if you think about the Cold War, we think about repressive military regimes. But there's also a long history in Latin America of military officers coming to political power and being real, uh, having real reformist policies, being real champions of social justice, partly because military men, unlike a lot of members of the Latin American elite, would spend a lot of time traveling their homelands, getting to know, for example, the rural poor, and getting to know their plight and coming to office and trying to change it. And I'll introduce you to a few of them here in a minute. And then the last thing that's worth pointing out is, of course, historically, and I'm a historian, if you look at Latin America um, over the long term, there's been a lot of really um, you know, transitions. So political trends, if we were to say go to Latin America, we've been there in 1950. 
So we had gone on a journey to travel to Mexico City and Rio and Buenos Aires and Havana. That would have been a fun journey. All of those countries would have been governed by democratic elected presidents. And that was kind of the universal trend right after World War II. If we had returned, say, in, you know, let's say 1978, we went to Buenos Aires to see the World Cup, the first time Argentina won. Uh, it was a moment of glory for Argentina, but it was also a moment of great tragedy because Argentina was living through a very brutal military dictatorship in a time that became known as the Dirty War. Um, and that wasn't unique to Argentina. Traveling through Latin America around 1980, you would have encountered very few people living under democratically elected governments. Um, you know, Costa Rica, um, Mexico, they were the outliers. Most people from Cuba to Argentina to Chile were living under dictatorships. Today we go there, and not only um, in the post-Cold War era have we seen the spread of democracy really everywhere, except, of course, our, 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 our good friends in Cuba. Venezuela and Nicaragua have more autocratic regimes today, as Castaneda points out. But overall, the vast, vast majority of Latin Americans are living under um, democratic regimes, and they're also very pluralistic regimes in that, you know, countries like uh, Chile and Brazil, their political leaders had to build coalitions because there's multiple parties that run in elections there. Um, and the same thing is the case in Mexico. So since, you know, 2000 or so, Mexico's usually had at least three viable candidates running for president. But if you were to go to Mexico today and look at the state level, you would find that among the governors of Mexico's 20 some states today, there's six different political parties represented. So there's a lot more political pluralism in this newly democratic Latin America. And there are countries, Latin Americans are no longer ruled by white men as they have been for much of the, of the past. So today uh, we've recently had indigenous uh, Native American presidents elected in Peru and in Bolivia. Um, We've had um, Arabs, Arab Americans, people of Arab descent. Currently, the president of El Salvador is of Arab descent. Um, there's a, quite a considerable uh, Arab immigrant, Arab descent population in Central America, as there is in Argentina or Brazil. So in the 1990s, Argentina also had a, a Syrian Argentine um, serve as president. And of course, we've had women serve as presidents in six different countries um, as, as elected presidents and several others as interim presidents. But if we had gone to Latin America in the year 2010, we would have encountered women um, serving as presidents in Brazil, Argentina, Chile, and, and where was the other one? Costa Rica. And Nicaragua and Panama have also had women serve as presidents. So a lot of real changes have taken place. Um, and on the flip side of that, one of the things we don't see, what, one of the things we also see is that for the time being, at least, the military has retired to its barracks. So there's no military men ruling anywhere in Latin America right now. Um, when Raul Castro stepped down as the president of Cuba, he had for a long time been the head of the armed forces in Cuba while his good brother Fidel was, was the leader. When he stepped down a few years ago, that was the last military man to be, to be ruling Latin America. So that's kind of where we are today. Um, and so I want to begin, being a historian, what I want to do is sort of put things in perspective by looking at following the lead of Jorge Castaneda, looking at sort of the history of a political left in Latin America over different generations to understand um, what sort of policy agendas the left has had historically and how it's changed over time. So if we'd gone to Latin America in the 1930s, you know, gone to Buenos Aires or Rio or Havana, Mexico City, we would have found a very vibrant left, a political left, um, also a cultural left with a lot of very prominent artists and intellectuals, uh, many of them, like Diego Rivera in Mexico, being members of communist parties. Um, we would have found students, teachers, union activists, all becoming increasingly uh, involved in the political life of their nations. Um, and we had political leaders, um, such as Lazaro Cardenas there on the left in Mexico, who was a, a general, he, so he was, a, he was himself a military man. Um, and then on the right, a former school teacher from the far south of Brazil named Getulio Vargas, um, who would be Brazil's president on and off again from the early 30s into the mid 1950s. And both of them sort of set out, carried out a broad political agenda um, to, to transform their homelands, kind of into something that would be like the social democracies that were established in Europe after World War II, with a strong, um, as strong as possible, um, a social welfare state, right, providing health care and education, better housing to societies that are becoming increasingly urbanized. <clears throat> 
Um, we would see labor rights being a very, very important concern. By the 1930s, a you know uh, industrial working class had emerged more strongly in countries like Mexico and Brazil, um, be it in you know, the oil industries or the mining industries or manufacturing and growing cities like Sao Paulo or Monterrey. So giving workers better rights, um, supporting their rights to unionization, um, and also knowing, of course, that unionized workers getting better benefits are going to support you as a politician. So that's part of it as well. What, that's one reason why they often call these political leaders populist leaders, because there are men of the people. Um, Getulio Vargas was known as the, the father of the poor, um, and they're both very, very successful in basically establishing broad new coalitions that brought middle urban middle class teachers and students and professionals into a coalition with urban workers and in the case of Mexico too, uh, with the rural peasantry. Because one of the things that Mexico did was that they carried out in the 1930s a very ambitious program of, of land reform. And of course, Mexico was a bit of an outlier at this moment because it had experienced a major social revolution in the 1910s, right? People had fought under the banner of land and liberty against a long-term dictatorship, um, uh, against the dominant economic influence of the United States, um, and they fought for land, they fought for labor rights, and they expected presidents like Lázaro Cárdenas to deliver, and he very much did. And so he carried out a land reform program that gave land to about one of every three uh, families in rural Mexico. And that's going to become kind of common, particularly up until, you know, the 50s or 60s, when much of Latin America was still very much agrarian societies with very, very unequitable distribution of land. So break apart the plantations and give land to the farm workers and in the case of Mexico, give land to a lot of indigenous communities that had, had, had their lands lost over the course of the, of the, of the 19th century. Um, and then the other kind of symbol of this time period, one of the other great policies widely shared by a lot of these political leaders, whether it's in Argentina, Chile, Brazil, Mexico, the bigger countries in Latin America, was to promote what we can call economic nationalism, right? Ending the, the powerful influence of foreign investors and their ownership of your key natural resources, which increasingly are being seen as part of the national patrimony. So in Chile, early on, there's a drive to someday nationalize the copper industry that accounted for about 90% you know, of the country's exports, um, and which, which was almost completely owned by two big American companies. But the real shining example, the real precedent that's going to be set would be in Mexico, where in 1938, um, President Cardenas essentially ends a strike by oil workers by intervening and nationalizing all the major oil companies that are operating in Mexico. And, and they were the world's biggest you know, oil companies in the world at that time. Um, so it was a very uh, dangerous precedent for the oil companies, but a very, very uh, proud moment for the Mexican people. Um, one, of the, one of the few policy initiatives of the revolutionary government that actually kind of unified everybody uh, uh, across Mexico. And to this very day, the March 18th, the day in which oil was nationalized is still in Mexico celebrated as a, as a federal holiday. But this was part of a broader policy objective of promoting not just economic nationalism, but industrialization as well, right? Reducing a country's dependence upon the importation of manufactured goods from Europe or the United States. Um, of course, the Great Depression helped accelerate that process. Um, but of course, industrialization created jobs for people who are increasingly migrating into urban areas. Um, and industry and manufacturing was a sign of progress. It was a sign that Latin America is going to get ahead and catch up with the United States and Europe. Right? So it was a cultural factor to that, that as well. And countries like Brazil and Argentina and Mexico are very much going to be, be start to industrialize very heavily during, during that time period. So again, this was a moment when we have a lot of democratic governments. Um, it was a moment when the United States, we also have a very reformist government, the New Deal government of Franklin Roosevelt. He, of course, was accused of being a radical socialist by his, his opponents at the time. Um, people accused President Cardenas of Mexico of being a communist. Um, he wasn't, but Mexico and Brazil and Argentina did have very strong uh, uh, communist parties uh, during this time period, just as we saw in Europe during the 1930s. That's going to, of course, end when we get into the Cold War. <laughs> and suddenly communism becomes a, a very considerable danger. We're still going to see a lot of um, reformist, uh, democratic, socialist, come into power and very interestingly try to carry out the very same kind of policies that Mexico had in the 30s, but with a lot less success because of the fears of communism. And you guys are all familiar with the Cold War. You're probably all familiar with how the United States 
government's foreign policy was to contain communism. And you should be aware of the fact that there was nowhere in the world where they were more worried about containing communism than in Latin America, right, in our backyard, because the fear was that, well, if communists take over Latin America, we're going to lose our closest allies and friends, right? And so it was a great concern. Um, and it's not going to help the fact that Cuba's revolution ends up becoming a communist revolution, because there finally is an example of what can happen, how a revolution can lead to uh, a communist state. But one of the things that we see as a result of this is that, for example, in Guatemala in the 1940s, when there's a, a democratic revolution, a very peaceful democratic revolution that brings down a longtime dictatorship and brings, a again, another military man to power. So that guy on the left there, Jacobo Arbenz, was from a very, very prominent um, Swiss Guatemalan family, family of large landowners, but he was a military man. And as such, he had spent a lot of time in the Guatemalan countryside, um, having to, among other things, as a junior officer, you know, conscript native peoples to go work on the coffee plantations during the harvest. So he saw the landlessness, the labor exploitation, all the problems that had beset one of the poorest, most underdeveloped countries in all of Latin America. And when he came to power in the early 50s, he set out to really change that. And so he did what Mexico had done 20 years before and instituted a wide ranging land reform program. He had a little bit of a, an advantage compared to Mexico, whereas in Mexico, a lot of the land was taken from very, very powerful Mexican families. In the case of Guatemala, almost all the, uh, the non-cultivated farmland was owned by an American banana company um, called the United Fruit Company. Today it's called Chiquita. Um, and so he was able to expropriate a lot of their lands, hundreds of thousands of acres that had lied follow. Um, he, he paid them for the land, so this wasn't uh, a unilateral process, but he paid them based upon their previous tax declarations. And of course, that's going to create some discrepancies in terms of what United Fruit Company is going to get paid and what they expect, what they actually expect to get paid. You know, millions of dollars of difference. <laughs> and so the United Fruit Company, to make a long story short, and some of you probably know about this, um, they, they're going to reach out to some of their contacts in Washington, D.C., and the CIA is going to become involved and it's going to carry out basically a covert operation. Right, working with conservative forces in the Guatemalan military to turn against uh, President Arbenz um, and orchestrate a, a military coup. Of course, they had the support of the political right in Guatemala. The Catholic Church was strongly opposed to the Arbenz government. Um, landowners were opposed to him. Certain military men were opposed to him. Um, and in 1954, he was deposed and goes into exile um, in, in Mexico City um, um, with many other Guatemalans. And so that becomes one of the more infamous episodes in, in quite a long history of CIA covert operations, because the end result is that democracy is extinguished and wouldn't return again until 1996. Um, and in the interceding years, Guatemala is going to Guatemala's are going to suffer extraordinary levels of repression that eventually is going to lead people to say, well, if we can't change things through peaceful democratic means, we'll take up arms and we'll fight for change that way. And by the 1970s, we have a civil war in, in Guatemala just as we will in neighboring El Salvador and Nicaragua. So that's one of the things that comes out of this. And then jump ahead 20 years later, and another thing that causes a lot of alarm in the United States happens in Chile. So Chile was the country that was always the outlier in Latin America and that the military had never played an activist role in, in, in Chilean democracy. So Chile had been established as a democracy. It had thrived as a democracy. It was often known by political scientists as the, the England of Latin America because of its deep democratic roots. And in 1970, as a result of that process, the Chilean people elected Salvador Allende, a physician, as their president. He happened to be a member of the Socialist Party and had built a coalition that brought the socialists and communists together. So it was a popular kind of front coalition um, that elected him into power. And one of the first things he did was what many Chileans had long wanted to see done, he nationalized the copper industry, nationalized the phone company, which was also an American-owned company. Um, and this, of course, aroused a lot of concern. As you can see here, Time Magazine, probably one of the number one sources of news for many Americans in the early 70s. That's how his election um, was depicted. And of course, it didn't go over well in the United States. And almost immediately, President Nixon ordered his Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, to quote unquote, make the economy scream. <laughs> Um, and then the CIA, once again, started working with his contacts with the Chilean military to convince them, and it took some time, um, to do something that the Chilean military had never done, which is disobey their constitutional duties, intervene in politics, and overthrow an elected president. 
And there you can see Henry Kissinger, the Secretary of State at the time, greeting the man who led that, Augusto Pinochet, General Augusto Pinochet, who's now going to lead Chile for the next uh, 20 years. But of course, one of the things that happens during this time period is the fact that there's the Cuban Revolution. So here's a Cuban Revolution. Again, it gets a dictatorship, a revolution that seemed to be democratic at the outset, but within two years, trade relations and then diplomatic relations between the United States and the Cubans broke down. Um, in the United States organized a paramilitary offensive to try to overthrow the revolutionary government at the Bay of Pigs. That, of course, failed. The Soviets stepped in and say, hey, we can help you out. Let's have an everlasting friendship. And before you know it, there's Fidel Castro, who two years earlier had been visiting Washington, D.C. and New York, <laughs> right? certainly after coming into power. There he is in Moscow with Nikita Khrushchev, um, who himself had also been who had recently visited the United States <laughs> in 1957. So this is what happens is that um, by the 1970s, increasingly democracies fall to dictatorship. And during that time period, young people, partly inspired by what had happened in Cuba, realizing that no change would come through democratic means, started to sort of follow the model of Fidel Castro and Che Guevara and say, we can take up arms. If they can do it in Cuba of all places, one of the United States' closest allies, maybe we can do it here. Maybe that's a way we can challenge dictatorship. Um, and the end result is, of course, that very few of them are going to succeed. Um, in South America, instead, we're going to see military regimes, most famously that of Argentina, but also Chile, carry out what became known as dirty wars against people they considered to be subversives. Who were those people? They were student activists, trade unionists, journalists, lawyers, the net would stretch very, very wide. And it meant in places like Argentina or Chile that tens of thousands of people are going to be murdered by the government, disappeared, um, ending up in mass graves, um, or if they're lucky, being forced into, into exile. That's the reality. That happens in Brazil, Uruguay, Argentina, Chile, Bolivia. The, 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 the list goes on and on in South America. Of course, in Central America, things work out a little differently where um, the young people who took up arms in the 1960s, increasingly their forces are going to grow, and they become very formidable rebel armies. Um, in Nicaragua in 1979, a rebel movement called the Sandinistas actually topples uh, a 40-year dictatorship uh, of the Somoza family. And in the neighboring countries of El Salvador and Guatemala, rebel forces are going to prove so strong that civil wars evolve over the 1990s. Um, and by the time they end, the, the military regimes there are basically going to have to say, let's negotiate for peace. Um, so at the end of the Cold War, we get peace. But again, in Central America, rather than tens of thousands of people killed, we get several hundred thousand. So that's how the Cold War is, is sadly going to play out you know, in Latin America. You know, uh, somebody asked me earlier, well, what do students know about Latin America? And they start my classes. Um, one of the things is they don't realize quite the extent to which, you know, Latin America really became killing fields during the Cold War, which you often associate as, you know, a time of non-conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union, but there's a lot of conflict elsewhere. And Latin America is one place where that conflict um, really, re really plays out um, to great tragic, tragic ends. So then there's going to be the transitions to democracy. And they really begin, in some cases, they begin in direct opposition to the military regimes. So it's not as if everybody remained acquiescent in places like South America during the time of military rule and despite the repression that they're experiencing. So over time, people began organizing themselves. Um, all of those countries had long histories of, of, of organized labor movements. And so workers' movements, particularly as the economic policies of the military governments started to fail, uh, workers began organizing again, carrying out street protests, general strikes, things of that nature. Um, and nowhere do we see this happen more clearly than in the case of Brazil. And perhaps one of the reasons why it could happen in Brazil more so than elsewhere with, with maybe less repression is that Brazil's military regime was simply less repressive. And by the early 1980s, it had been in, in power for you know, almost 20 years. And so everybody kind of came to understand that we're gonna have some kind of a political opening and trade union activists really took advantage of that, particularly in Sao Paulo. So Sao Paulo is the, uh, along with Monterey, Mexico, one of the big industrial hubs of Latin America. Sao Paulo's industrial economy is heavily based upon the auto industry. 
it is really the Detroit of Latin America, particularly back in the 70s and 80s. And so a lot of uh, workers in the in the the auto and the auto parts industries, the metalworking industries, really became better organized. They began carrying out a series of strikes, directly defying the government. Um, and among in the in the, the midst of this movement, one gentleman in particular emerges as a very uh, uh, strategic and charismatic leader. And this would be Luis Ignacio da Silva, um, a guy who is very prototypical of of the Brazil working class, industrial working class of his generation, and that his family had moved down into Sao Paulo from the hard scrabble north of Brazil um, back in the 1950s and 60s when there was kind of this great migration of tens of millions of peoples living, um, you know, the north of Brazil is kind of like the American South and that is way more underdeveloped versus Sao Paulo. There was a booming job market there. So people like him migrated down there. Um, but, you know, like like a lot of those people, he, he didn't spend a lot of time in school. He was working by the time he was 12 years old, he eventually got into a sort of vocational training program, got trained as a lathe operator, got a job as a metal worker, um, and then becomes a, a union activist. Right? And the factory he worked in um, helped lead these major, major strikes in, in 1980 and 81. And then in the aftermath of those somewhat successful strikes, he's going to spend some time in jail. Um, they found a, 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 an, op an opposition party like the workers party They're like you know the traditional political parties in brazil have been a little bit too cozy with the military dictatorship let's create a new party there'll be the party of the working class the union workers um, eventually a lot of environmental activists become involved in the workers party the workers party would advocate for land reform in rural brazil so it starts to create some a broad coalition um and eventually when democracy is restored lula is going to go from being a union of activists to a presidential candidate and he'll try three times before he's finally elected president in 2003. And so it very much kind of symbolizes the really dramatic changes that take place. And then not only do you have the restoration of democracy, but you have a, you know, a trade union activist in a very, very a society that's very sort of uh, has very strong class divisions, uh, more so than in the United States, getting elected as president um, and then reelected um, and then reelected again just last year. <laughs> So he's kind of a symbol of that. Two other people that would be symbolic of that would include his successor there on my right, Gilma Rousseff, right, the Workers' Party candidate who, who succeeded him, because in Brazil you can only do two consecutive terms. Um, and then the woman on the left, Michelle Bachelet. So both of them would have been considered back during the during the Cold War as, you know, dangerous Marxists. Uh, Michelle Bachelet from Chile, her father was a leading uh, uh, officer in the, on the, in the Air Force, who's a leader of the Air Forces, and when the military coup happened in Chile, he was part of the division of the military who opposed it. He was a so-called constitutionalist. And so he and some other very leading military officers, um, they're going to end up on the wrong side of that situation. Um, he, um, instead of being able to go into exile, he's going to be arrested and tortured and actually killed while, while in confinement um, by his you know, former comrades in the, in the military. Um, and so Michelle is a uh, pretty young woman at that time, and her and her family then are allowed to go into exile. And she actually grows up and is educated in East Germany. Uh, and then comes back afterwards, becomes involved once again in the Socialist Party, which with the restoration of democracy in, in, in Chile in the 1990s, you get the return of the socialists and suddenly they're not as dangerous as they seemed in the past. So she's gonna get elected um, um, twice, 2016, 2014, um, and then, as I said at the outset, in the most recent elections in Chile, another young man, probably even way, way more to the left of her, um, is, has recently been elected president in Gabriel um, Boric. And then Jill Madrushev, she herself had been a young university student when the military seized power in Brazil in 1964. And she became involved in what was known as the urban guerrilla movement. So young students sort of organizing themselves, carrying out, you know, bank robberies, setting off a few bombs here and there. They weren't very successful. They weren't going to they weren't going to succeed in overthrowing the regime. She ended up spending quite a long time in prison, will be a victim of torture, um, but eventually gets out, gets a degree in engineering, works for the state oil company, and then becomes involved in politics and herself gets herself elected president. So th these are all very symbolic of sort of the, the great transition to democracy that takes place during that time period. Um, but one thing I'd noticed that Jorge Castaneda does not really touch on um, is the fact that there's also a political right in Latin America. <laughs> If you're going to have a left, you have to have a light, and you have to, you have, of course, a, a center. So, if we were to look, talk about the political right a little bit, we could take the two biggest countries in Latin America. We could begin by Mexico. So, Mexico, the major party on the political right, and it's really more 
center right, I would say, is a party known as the um, National Action Party, or PAN, as it's known in its Spanish acronym. And it's actually a party that was founded back in the 1930s. So it's kind of founded as a party in opposition to Lazaro Cardenas and the what's going to become the ruling revolutionary party. It's going to be a more conservative party that brings together both sort of conservative Catholics who had been staunchly opposed to the revolution because of its very secular orientation and policies, but also the business sector. So the people who are really going to initially finance uh, the, the pond will be the, the Monterey industrial elite. So Monterey's got the most powerful business class in, in all of Mexico, really probably the most influential in all of Latin America. They were not too happy about the revolutionary government and its policies of promoting union rights and things like that. So early on, they throw their support behind this party. Um, it's going to remain out in the wilderness. It becomes sort of the loyal opposition for those long 70 years when the PRI is the ruling party of Mexico. But then as, as the economy gets really, really bad in Mexico in the 80s and 90s, and the ruling party carries out its new sort of neoliberal policies, kind of alienating in many of its former supporters, we're going to see Mexico, the opposition grow. Um, and the key moment comes in 2000, when for the first time in 70 years, an opposition candidate is going to be elected as president of Mexico. And that would be the gentleman there on the left named Vicente Fox, who himself was um, had been the head of, of Coca-Cola in Mexico for years. He came from the business classes himself. Um, and if you don't know this, Coca-Cola Mexico is a very, very big enterprise. Mexico's drink a lot of Coke, so he's a prominent businessman. And he's the one then that brings in Jorge Castaneda, right, as his foreign minister. So the PAN remains the sort of dominant um, opposition party in Mexico. He would be succeeded by another PAN presidential candidate named uh, Jorge Calderon. Um, and then, of course, in Brazil, probably most probably better known today in the United States would be Jair Bolsonaro. Um, who some people often call the Trump of the tropics, <laughs> and he probably loves that title. He's he's pretty close to, to President, former President Trump. Um, he himself is interesting that he's a former military man. He is very clear in his nostalgia for that long years of the military dictatorship. For him and a lot of his followers, those were great years in Brazil. It was an era of law and order and economic prosperity for a while. <laughs> And he's very nostalgic for that, um, as some people in Chile are for the military dictatorship there, not so much so in neighboring Argentina. But Jair Bolsonaro is interesting. He builds, you know, he was re he was defeated in the recent elections by Lula very narrowly, but his new political party has done very well. They have they're the majority party in Brazil's Congress now, and it's part of a sort of a new coalition um, that's emerged in Brazil as sort of the Brazil's political right, if you will, that's known in Brazil as the three Bs. Um, which line up perfectly in English as beef, Bibles, and bullets. What does that mean? Well, beef, well, the, 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 the agricultural interests. You know, Brazil has some very, very agricult powerful agriculturalists in terms of uh, the soybean industry, the cattle industry. You know, the biggest beef producing company in the world um, is, is a Brazilian company. It's the biggest beef producing company here in the United States. It's called JBS. Most people have never heard of it, but they own more beef packing plants here than any other country that there is. And as we know, that's a big part of our economy. So there's the cat, the, the agricultural interest. And of course, very famously, Jair Bolsonaro, when he came into power, he basically let everybody know the Amazon basin is once again open for business. So if you want to go in there and tear down the forest and carry out some mining activities or expand your soybean operations, you're welcome to do so. And that happened in devastating fashion just in the four years he was in power. Um, Bibles, what does that mean? Well, Brazil, more than anywhere else in Latin America, has seen a tremendous growth in the evangelical Christian movement, right? It goes back a long time, but it's very, very powerful. Um, you know, a lot of members of Brazil's soccer team are almost all evangelical Christians. Um, a lot of them actually strongly supported Bolsonaro. That helps a lot. Um, and Bolsonaro and his, and his movement is very clever, too. They've adopted as their sort of uniform the national team jersey of Brazil's soccer team. So when you ever see the demonstrations, so everybody wearing the canary yellow shirt, which is soccer is big in Brazil, and there's a, always a close alliance between politics and soccer, and he kind of takes advantage of that old trick. So the evangelical community was really strongly supportive of him, um, despite the fact that Bolsonaro himself has a kind of a question, questionable, you know, he wasn't always so morally upright himself in his own personal behavior over the years. But, you know, the evangelical Christians can, can forgive people. Um, and then bullets, what does that mean? Well, that's about law and order. Can you see his 
pulling the trigger thing, that became a symbol was on the campaign trail. And he was a candidate of law and order. He's a former military man. And he basically said, we need to give the federal police and the military a lot more rights to go in and deal with the gang problems and criminal problems, which are very, very bad in Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. So again, that tapped into a lot of sentiments of the urban middle classes, who otherwise probably wouldn't support a lot of his policies. But you know, they, they like the idea of not only having a stronger police presence and greater, um, even more immunity than the police are being enjoying in Brazil, but also he made a, he, he passed a bunch of laws to make it possible for Brazilians themselves to go out and buy guns. So there's been a proliferation of a gun culture in Brazil in the last four years in which millions of people became for the first time ever owners of firearms. Again, kind of like what we see in uh, uh, up here in the United States. So, so Bolsonaro lost the election, but that movement is still going to be very strong in Brazil. And Brazil being, you know, the the largest country in Latin America, that's that's important. So, that's a little bit on the political right. And then the new left. So today I'll end with this. So all these new political leaders I started by talking about, what are their what's their policy agenda? It's a lot different than it had been back in the 30s or during the Cold War. Um, so today a lot of the people we see involved, there's a real strong. Um, generational shift in Latin America that young people once again are being very actively involved in politics and in street protests and in distinct movements and in particular young women. Whether we talk about Mexico or Colombia or Chile or Argentina, right, women are often at the forefront of these movements. And a lot of the things that they're putting on the left agenda have to do with women's rights. There's been a very pervasive problem in places like Mexico and Argentina with femicide, right? domestic violence and the murder of women for being women, very pervasive in parts of Mexico and Argentina. But abortion rights is really the big thing. You know, until recently, abortion was, was criminalized almost everywhere in Latin America. So part of this movement, depending on the country, is either the, the decriminalization of abortion so that women who are accused of, uh, of abortion are put in jail. Uh, but in some countries, it's also the legalization of abortion. So in Argentina, Uruguay, Colombia, Abortion has been legalized, and in Mexico it has been, but it's going to be up to each individual state in Mexico to decide if it wants to go through, kind of like, like in the United States. So a very interesting development in Latin America, um, especially if you consider what's going on in the United States of America at the, at the exact same time. Um, indigenous rights is another key aspect of um, the new political left. And it's not just indigenous rights and issues unique to indigenous communities in places like Peru or Mexico, but also a lot of indigenous activism, a lot of communities themselves becoming way more active in politics. And what, you know, in the United States, we often call it identity politics, but taking pride in their indigenous heritage, organizing political movements around that heritage. It's very much part of the new coalition government in Chile, of the Mapuche Indians and their drive to get access to the lands that were taken from them generations ago. Um, and some of them are, are, are quite militant. And tied into this indigenous activism then is environmentalism. Because when these extractive industries like oil and mining are developed in places like Colombia or Peru, the people who, who most experience the negative environmental consequences are indigenous communities. Some of these new leaders, most famously the new, newly elected president of, of Colombia and of Brazil are making environmentalism really a key part of their new policy platform. So Lula in Brazil made it very clear that we're going to immediately go in to the Amazon and try to, try to stop the process of deforestation that's been happening. Um, we're going to strengthen that aspect of our environmental agency. And, and in Colombia, it's going to be interesting to see how things play out. Colombia's new president has made it clear, we are not going to allow any more oil or coal developments to happen in Colombia. But we'll see if that happens, because kind of as Castaneda points out, countries like Colombia are very, very dependent upon the exportation of, well, in the case of Colombia, both oil and coal as a means of generating foreign revenues. So be interested to see how that, that's going to play out. Immigrant rights has become, uh, and immigration in general has become a very major policy in Latin America, because really for the first time ever, we see a tremendous amount of immigration, migration within Latin America itself, uh, most notably of Venezuelans. So in recent years, in the last 10 or 15 years, six to seven million Venezuelans have left that country. So it's one of the largest outflows of refugees we've seen anywhere in the world. Um, some of them have come to the United States. Um, a growing number are actually coming here to, to Indianapolis. Um, but more than anywhere, they're going to other parts of Latin America. About 2 million of them alone have gone to, to Colombia, um, which itself has then passed policies um, to make it easier for them to integrate themselves into society, giving them humanitarian visas, uh, 
um, the rights to work, their children, the rights to education. But it's very, it's very controversial. You know, Colombia is not exactly a, a prosperous, wealthy country that can simply absorb two million newcomers when there's already a lot of displaced communities in that country itself. So there has been a sort of a nativist backlash as more immigrants are moving around. In Argentina, in recent elections, there was a lot of concern about the increasing arrival of Bolivians and Paraguayans uh, to, to the Buenos Aires area. Um, and the same thing in Chile in recent elections, a lot of nativist backlash against all the Peruvians and Bolivians are migrating south to a more prosperous Chile in search of opportunity. And then the last thing I'll say on a more really positive and upbeat note, the really big change has happened is that human rights now for the last 10 or 15 years has been a big part of the agenda of, of, of the political left. Um, people have come to better understand what happened during the times of the military dictatorships and the dirty war. There's been truth commissions, there's been academic research, there's been victims and victims' families coming forward, and more importantly, people have been put on trial for crimes against humanity. In some cases, it took a while because part of the transition to democracy was that the military insisted on being given amnesty or immunity from any persecution, for what they said was a just war against communist subversives. Um, but courts in places like Uruguay, Argentina, or Chile have found a way around that. They found that those amnesties were unconstitutional. And in all those cases, they've been putting people on trial. Augusto Pinochet in Chile was living under house arrest and was ready to be put on trial when he was when he passed away. Um, in Guatemala, um, a president was put on trial for actually for genocide based upon the idea that his military regime particularly targeted indigenous communities. So the first time a former head of state was ever put on trial for genocide um, by his own government, happened recently in, in Guatemala. But more than anywhere where this has happened is in Argentina. Argentina suffered the, the, the worst consequences of the dirty war. Um, and in Argentina, over the last 10 years, um, almost a thousand former military and police officers have been put on trial for crimes against humanity, including these two guys here who were two of the leading generals of the military junta. Uh, in the 70s and, and early 80s. So even people like them have been have been put on trial. And in many cases, were given you know, you know, life sentences to prison. So it's really, really tremendous change. Um, and it's a real sign of how, how far things have come in terms of how people perceive the military, um, no longer seeing the military. I can guarantee you in places like Argentina, as bad as things are going to get in terms of maybe economic instability and things are bad there, nobody's clamoring for the military to come back to power. So I'll end on that note there. That's the, the new left. <laughs> and um, I hope that if I come back in five years, we, we, we won't be talking about the return of the military from the barracks <laughs> uh, again. <laughs> so thank you, and I'll be happy to take All right, Michael, questions. Thank Michael, thank you very much. That was uh, uh, very interesting and brought out a lot of kind of uh, complimentary facts to uh, what our, our reading had for us. Um, I, I'll start out with a question, and uh, for those of you who, who have a question, please uh, send a note to me in the chat if you'd like to ask your question. I will call on you kind of in the order they received. Uh, if you'd like me to ask the question for you, I'll be happy to do that, but you know, we certainly encourage people to, to ask their own questions. So please just, uh, just send me a little note to that effect. Um, so I, I'll start out here. Uh, you, you have... You didn't, and uh, nor did, did our author of our article talk about some of the smaller countries in uh, South and Latin America, Suriname, Uruguay. Um, you know, what's happening in these countries? Are they economically and politically kind of dependent on their neighbors, tied to their neighbors? You know, what what's the life like in those places? <laughs> well, as I kind of implied at the outset, uh, it's hard to draw general characteristics. So if you go to Uruguay, which I always tell my students this, if I had to move to Latin America for the rest of my life, the place I would choose to go live would be Uruguay. <laughs> so Uruguay is pretty prosperous. Uruguay is always, they, so if, if Chile used to be called the England of Latin America, they used to call Uruguay the Switzerland of Latin America. It's small, <laughs> there's only about 3 million people there, but Uruguay was one of the first countries in the world to develop a, a social welfare system of universal health care, housing, education. It's easy to do that when you have an abundance of, lucrative exports, mainly agricultural, and a relatively small population. It's perfectly situated there in the South Atlantic. There's beautiful beaches. Montevideo has a lot of charming colonial architecture. It's a society, very diverse society of immigrants. Great food. 
So it is as your guys are doing very well. And your guys still like wave, it's always been the most it to experience a military dictatorship. But aside from that, it's always been the most progressive society in Latin America in terms of its politics. So in terms of you know, the first one, the universal health care, for example, uh the first country in the world to legalize marijuana. So <laughs> But that's not the reason why I'd, I'd want to move there, because <laughs> I can go to Illinois and get that done. So that's good. that's good. But then we could, if you wanted a, a, a great, you know, juxtaposition, we could talk about El Salvador, a country I mentioned a little bit. So El Salvador is relatively small, maybe six and a half million people. Um, however, the El Salvador would have a bigger population if it wasn't for the fact that there was close, there's close to three million ethnic Salvadorans living in the United States. So about forty percent of all Salvadorans now live in the U.S. So that means that El Salvador, what? Well, it's probably worth mentioning. You know, today there are 65 million or so Latino Americans living north of the U.S.-Mexican border. So if we were to consider that a community, that would be the third most populous country in Latin America after Brazil and Mexico. But this means that El Salvador, a country that experienced 12 years of a really brutal civil war and a lot of economic displacement and devastation some natural disasters since then, a very similar problem with criminal violence. Um, El Salvador has never really recovered to the place it was. Politically, it's doing well. It's, it's a democracy. The former rebel movement became a political party and several presidents who've been elected since the end of the Cold War were former rebel leaders themselves. So that's a really symbolic of the transition that happened, but it's been beset by a lot of problems and a lot of violence. Um, economically, El Salvador depends almost more than any other country in the world on remittances sent back from immigrants in the United States. So the money they send back is um, about 25% of the total GDP. So that tells you a lot, a lot right there about the level of economic development. Yeah. So, but it's also very interesting too, because, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, countries like um, El Salvador and Honduras in particular um, received a lot of immigration from the Arab world, uh, in the early 20th century, um, and many um, Arab Arab Central Americans have become, you know, uh, merchants. They tend to be urban middle class professionals or merchants. They've been long been involved in politics, um, and recently one of them was finally elected president after several others ha had run. So his name is Nayib Bukali, and unlike most Arab um, uh, Latin Americans, he himself is is Muslim. So most of them are Christian, but he's actually Muslim. So the first Muslim president in the Americas uh, is currently the president of El Salvador. And he came into the presidency at a time when El Salvador was suffering. You know, one of the reasons why people are still emigrating from El Salvador to the United States is because of the staggering levels of criminal violence. So around the time when he came into power three years ago, um, El Salvador pretty much had the highest murder rate in the world of any country not at war. <laughs> That's bad. That's yeah. why a lot of people are leaving. But he yeah. stepped in and initially kind of struck a deal with some of the two main gangs. And these, we're not talking about, you know, the Sinaloa cartel, we're talking about street gangs that just dominate local neighborhoods and society through extortion, low-level drug trafficking, things like that, but they ruin everybody's lives. Um, and you guys have probably heard of some of them, Mara Salvatrucha, for example, is one, because they have some presence in the United States. But they're pervasive there, and starting about a year ago, President Bukele declared a state of emergency, and he ordered the... Um, basically handed over control of law and order to the Salvadoran military, something that, you know, 10 years ago, people would have abhorred the idea of giving that kind of power to the military in El Salvador. But he handed it over to them, and under a state of emergency, they have the right to arrest and detain and imprison anybody they want without even formally charging them with anything. And thousands of young, mostly men, um, in the late teens or 20s have been arrested. In the last year, the already large prison population of El Salvador has doubled. Um, and the prisons in El Salvador are horrific. And you read stories about families who don't even know where their sons are. It's almost all men they're picking up. But neighborhoods that were dominated by these gangs are now living freely. They're not having to pay extort extortionary taxes to run their local businesses or shops. People can send their daughters to school without them being you know, harassed by the gang gangbangers. And today, by most surveys, Nayib Bukele is considered the single most popular president in the world. <laughs> he has like an 85% approval rating, despite the fact he's literally taken away everybody's civil liberties. So those yeah. two interesting contrasts, Uruguay and El Salvador. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> uh, 
Claire Collins had a, a question for you. Uh, hi. Um, you mentioned the auto industry in Mexico and Brazil, mm -hmm. and I just wondered uh, what brands do they produce, or are they just subsidiaries of American and European and uh, Asian brands? Uh, and mm -hmm. have they embraced electric cars at this time? <laughs> well, that's a great question. And, and they're both a little bit distinct. So both of them developed auto industries around the same time based upon the arrival of foreign auto companies. So in the case of Mexico, those foreign companies were uh, one that you probably recall called Chrysler mm -hmm. and Ford and GM. And then came Nissan and then Volkswagen. Same thing in Brazil. Brazil is a little bit different though because Brazil's government partly motivated by this idea that you know we want to have some economic independence early on set very clear rules for the auto companies and that you can establish companies here that they have to be wholly owned subsidiaries. So for example, when Ford went into Brazil, they had to create a separate subsidiary, which is called Ford do Brasil. So it's a wholly separate company that operates in Brazil. They have their own research and development uh, operations there. Volkswagen would do the same thing. So there they get Brazilian, you know, it's not just assembling cars with parts and components brought in from outside. It's like we are developing cars for our own unique market. And there's some amazing cars that were developed in Brazil over the years that are only were available to the Brazilian market. They're actually in high demand among collectors in the United States and Europe because they were so kind of because cool looking, you know, small cars. Um, and Brazil is also um, engineers in Brazil pioneered. Um, so in the end of the day, there's still these foreign owned auto companies, but there's a lot of pioneering innovations that have been carried out in Brazil. And in fact, the creation of what today we call ethanol, that was first developed by Brazilian auto engineers, because in the 1970s, when there was the oil crisis, before Brazil was able to discover the massive amounts of oil that it has today, it was completely dependent upon the importation of oil. During the oil crisis of the 70s, when oil went sky high, Brazil was already heavily dependent upon autos and particularly trucks and buses. Um, and their engineers came up with the idea of using um, uh, the byproducts of sugarcane processing to create what's, what, what's ethanol. Um, and it's actually way more effective than using corn. So it's a lot more environmentally friendly. You don't have to use as much electricity and products to do ethanol. And so they even created engines um, in case people are gonna switch back and forth. So they have engines in Brazil that you can shift it back and forth for either the ethanol or, or fuel. So they've had a lot of innovations. And in the case of Mexico, which is, you know, both of those are probably in the top six auto producing countries in the world today. In the case of Mexico, just about every major global auto maker you can imagine now has plants in Mexico, everyone. So BMW, Nissan, Hyundai, Audi, et cetera. I, I mean, I don't think Ferrari does, but <laughs> there's not much of a market for Ferraris in Mexico. Um, but every, you know, probably at least a dozen different automakers are there. And of course, all the big American automakers that are there. And some of the, the first uh, trucks, I think, made by Ford, I think Ford is already uh, retooling their big plant in northern Mexico to produce um, electric pickup trucks. So it, it's that's coming there as well. Do they have an active labor union in uh, the auto industry there? It's not as active as it used to be. Mm -hmm. So there's there are some auto industry, but um, that's that was a big issue when they had when they renegotiated NAFTA was giving mm -hmm. Mexican workers better rights to organize unions because so the union movement there used to be very strong was kind of decimated by the change of government and by the weakening of labor laws um, um, and, and things like that. So it's not as, it's, you know, it's, it's some of the plants are unionized, some are not, but of course here in the United States, uh, the auto industry is no longer as unionized as it used to be either. It is here in the Midwest, but the majority of new plants in the United States, which are also foreign, just as in Mexico. So we're kind of experiencing the same thing as Mexico. Our auto industry now depends on foreign direct investment from the big European or Asian companies. And they're almost all opening their plants in places from South Carolina to Tennessee to Mississippi. And those are all non-union plants. Yeah. So here in North America, the one place where auto workers are fully unionized is our neighbor to North and Canada. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, actually, I have a little maybe follow up question there. Um, the electric car part of the question, uh, the mining of lithium, I think, is uh, a big deal in Chile and Bolivia and so forth. And 
So that would be a, you know, another element of the electric car issue, the extractive industries you talked about before. Yes, it is. And Argentina as well. Yeah. So the largest deposits of lithium are in those three countries. And um, particularly in the case of Chile, they, so the, the current president of Chile made it very clear, we're not going to allow lithium to become what copper used to be, dominated by foreign, foreign interests. They're still going to depend upon a foreign market because Chile is not going to have a big, a lot of electric <laughs> auto battery factories. But uh, one of the things they've already done in Chile is they've set up a national lithium company so that the lithium industry will be national. It'll be a government enterprise so that the profits that come from lithium will go back into the, there'll be national patrimony. So I'll be interested yeah. to see how, how that plays out. Yeah. Okay. Thank that's you. A good, that's no. a good point. And, uh, the newest, I think the newest Betty's resources. got a question. Yeah. Michael, my question is very, very brief. And it's really just a, a curiosity question. I could probably look it up in a uh, quick search. Uh, when Fidel Castro first came into power, I know he came to the U.S. I believe he spoke before the United Nations. Am I vaguely remembering? Because I, you know, <laughs> was old enough, I was alive when this happened, dating myself. Didn't we give him a ticker tape parade in New York? Yeah, he had. A, they had a parade for him in in New York. So it was a tick, was, it was a ticker tape parade. We were uh, still. Yeah, there. I don't know if it's a ticker tape parade. I don't know about that. Okay, but he, it was a parade. But he came and he was very astute. So there was a parade for him because there was a because there was a big there was tradition a large Cuban community in the New York and northern New Jersey. Um, but he went to Washington D.C. So yeah. that was most important. So he goes to Washington D.C. He visits the, the Lincoln Memorial. One of the most famous pictures of Rudolph Trump is standing in front of the Lincoln Memorial, looking up at it and reading the recitations. Um, he goes to he has a meeting with with Vice President Nixon and some State Department officials. But he speaks on um, Meet the Press, the Sunday morning news show. And you can still find that on YouTube. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. And, and we had no... like, you're not a communist, are you? No, no, I'm not. <laughs> well, I mean, he wasn't at that point. I think no, we had, he wasn't. He, we had an opportunity with him at that point. Very briefly, can you remind us, how well, did we mess that up? Well, it's, but it takes it takes two to mess things up that badly. But yes, um, you know things were messed up in that. Very famously, when he met with Nixon, one of Nixon's assistants afterwards, writing his briefing of what what happened, says uh, Vice President Nixon spoke to him like a father. Mm. And you should see the picture. It's a great picture I showed to my students of Nixon kind of meeting with him and Fidel looking at him like. Who do you think you're talking to? But it's just that paternalistic attitude that had always been there. I mean, for generations, Americans kind of depicted Cubans as being like children who didn't know how to govern themselves. I mean, it's a long, long history of U.S. Latin American relations that played out there. And he's, he's, he's at the point, it's like, you know, you know, and right away, the United States is insisting, well, when are you going to hold elections? It's like, well, seven years ago, when Batista seized power, the first thing you did was recognize his government <laughs> and then gave him up weapons to fight against the opposition. And he didn't insist upon him having an election. So why are you telling us we have to have elections right away? So it's a little bit that. And then, of course, he did. He began carrying out. Uh, he basically, Cuba had a very progressive constitution they drew up in 1940 that included land reform and labor rights. So there was already in place this promise. And when he came into power, he basically said, well, all I have to do now is enforce the 1940 Constitution. So right away, he became seizing uh, uh, sugar plantations and distributing right. that land to the sugar mill workers themselves. And of course, that caused a lot of trouble because, you know, the biggest landowner in Cuba, the biggest sugar plantation owner was, guess who? The United Fruit Company. Right. So they're known for bananas, but in Cuba, they had the largest sugar lands. And so then right away, the United States comes back and says, you can't do that. And they started a partial trade embargo threatening not to buy the, 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 the sugar, which that, that was Cuba's economy at that time. That was their source of foreign revenue. Um, so that's how things began. And then the Soviets stepped in quickly and said, we'll buy your sugar. Right. Yeah. Then before you know it, then the United States government pressures the two American-owned oil refineries to stop refining oil to kind of cripple the economy. So he seizes those two refineries. Mm -hmm. right. And they didn't want them to use those, run those refineries because they were using Soviet crude oil. So it was literally tit for tat, tit for tat, month by month. And then it became diplomatic relations broken. But meanwhile, the United States government had already devised their Bay of Pigs operation. So they're already training exiles in Florida to invade Cuba and overthrow his government. The CIA was already carrying out 
programs of economic sabotage on the island. And of course they failed. And then before you know it, he was like, well, the Soviets are buying our, you know, we have a, a trade relations with the Soviets and now they're mm -hmm. gonna provide us with security. And then comes the Cuban Missile Crisis and then the complete break that has endured to this very day, except for a brief interlude. You guys may remember when Obama was president kind of stunned everybody by saying, guess what? For the last year, we've had secret negotiations up in Canada with Cubans and we're gonna reestablish diplomatic relations and trading relations. And hey, if anybody wants to go visit Cuba, right. open for business. And so for like three years, it looked like things were gonna change. And then when Trump got elected, very much elected with the support of the very active Cuban American community of South Florida. Right. Boom, right away we go back. And and Biden has maintained it. it, it, it so it's a question, then at least to another very quickly, is does it surprise you? I remember when the Cubans first came, and of course they were very rigidly conservative. They were they were the Batistas followers and, and justifiably conservative as a result of that. But this is now a couple of generations later, or at least one generation later. Does it surprise you? And of course, they did a little Havana in Miami. Does it surprise you that it seems that even the children, the offspring of the of the first Cubans coming over, still seem to be as conservative, or does it not? I well, when you because now we can talk about a third generation. And actually, a lot of the people that came over weren't, weren't as, there was a lot of people that came over by the mid '60s who had supported the revolution and then felt it had been betrayed. So they're the middle classes. They weren't all just Batista supporters. So a lot of people like that. Um, and so they were that way. And, you know, you know, it's like within any political community, there are some hardliners there. Yeah. You know, and it used to be in the 70s a lot worse. If you even thought about inviting in a Cuban, you know, musician to play in your club, you could have your club bombed. So mm -hmm. things used to be. I mean, Miami used to be the terrorism capital of the United States with bombings and things like that. Um, today, I think what it is, it's, you know, you have the people that are very politically active. By the 1980s, the Cuban Americans were very savvy in terms of politics. So they very quickly became naturalized citizens, probably because US immigration policy facilitated that. So they were given all kinds of privileges like that. But they created this Cuban American National Foundation, which is their main lobbying group based in Washington, DC. Um, it's almost like APAC, Jewish Supporters for Israel. And that was their model. And they said, we're gonna be able to, we're gonna mobilize our people and we're gonna put support on the pressure on the United States government to maintain <laughs> pressure on Cuba. And of course, right. out of South Florida, you've got you know generations now of Cuban Americans getting elected to office. Uh, the Diaz Balart brothers, uh, Rubio, et, et cetera. So if you go to Cuba today, there's always people that are going to be mobilizing and they turn out and they get the vote. But I think if you go talk to a lot of, you know, the third generation, the grandchildren of those migrants, they maybe have gone to visit Cuba to visit their family's homeland. And I don't think a lot of them are eager to like say, we're going to go back to Cuba. <laughs> but they're very, they're very, they're very savvy at maintaining that, 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 that political stance. Yeah. Charlie Boswell had a kind of a follow-up question that, you know, is, is it of any value for, for us to continue these sanctions against Cuba? I mean, in the, in the long run, other than pleasing the sort of this group. It's, down it's all I mean, a lot of it has to do with politics. Uh -huh. You know, I think it's, I mean, look, we have trade, look how long we've had trading relations with Vietnam. I mean, just think about China, but think about Vietnam and we've had, we opened up diplomatic and trading relationships with them a generation ago. Um, it's unfortunate. I I defied the ban back in 1998 and went to Cuba by way of Mexico and spent three weeks there and I loved it. So it's unfortunate that more Americans don't get a chance to go there. I've never been anywhere. I've traveled a lot in my life. I've never been anywhere where people were more welcoming and hospitable than the people of Cuba were. At that time in the late 90s, very few Americans went there. Nobody could ever guess where I was from. They would list. Oh, they're very <laughs> smart. They're very high. It's a very highly educated population. That's one of the real achievements of the revolution. That they're very highly educated, and they'd find out I was from the United States. It's like, oh my God, it's so great <laughs> to hear. And I have family in New Jersey or my, you know, Miami, and they were really, really, really welcoming, and they were very, uh, you know, in, in those in that time still in pretty, pretty good spirits. The fact is fact that you know, Cuba was Cuba is impoverished. Kind of a universal, universally impoverished. Um, things have gotten worse since then. So there's a new generation. You know, last year, over 100,000 Cubans arrived to the United States. Um, and increasingly, they're not necessarily settling just in Miami. So one of the, the cities in the United States has had the fastest growing Cuban population over the last decade is not too far away. It's called Louisville, Kentucky. Hmm. 
And there's about 30,000 Cubans there. And there's like 10 Cuban restaurants there. So if you want to get a taste of Cuba, you don't have to go too far. <laughs> you can go down to, down to Louisville and experience it firsthand. Okay. Uh, Lois Meyer, you got a comment you'd like to make? You there, Lois? <laughs> she might have her mute on. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, there Thank you, you Michael, for this talk. I um, have a long history with Latin America. I've collaborated very closely with indigenous teachers in Oaxaca, Mexico for 23 plus years. And my colleagues are very politically active and powerful. They're part of what's called Seccion 22. Uh, but generally, they are not supportive of Lopez Obrador's supposedly leftist policies. In general, in Latin America, here's my question. What do you see indigenous people's feelings to be about these so-called leftist governments that still do not respect or prioritize their indigenous rights, identities, and concerns? Uh, that's a great question. And that, that's fascinating that you've been involved uh, with the, uh, and, and that section, that's the that's a teacher's union local. Yes, yes, it it's is. It's famously very militant. Yes. There's no, none are more militant than the teachers of Oaxaca. And in fact, the largest single union in all of Latin America is Mexico's teachers union. Yeah. So it's yeah. been very, very prominent. They're amazing and have taught me a hell of a lot. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Um, yeah, I know teachers union activists when I lived in Monterey. Um, and, you know, it's interesting in that the teachers union for a long time, when it was ruled by sort of a corrupt jefe, <laughs> um, yeah. was, a, was a staunch supporter of the ruling party. But probably in the case of Mexico, because of that, the teachers union activists um, would, are familiar with Lopez Obrador's past. <laughs> yeah. So Lopez Obrador comes out of the old ruling party. So he's part of the group that kind of split away from that party back in the 1980s and became more of a center-left politician. But I think sometimes it's hard to escape the political culture that came with that ruling party. And I think a lot of people in Mexico who, I mean, the truth of the matter is that to this day, he has a lot of popular support, it seems, and a lot of it's from the urban and rural poor. So it's interesting that in Oaxaca that there's opposition like that. Um, but I think he's disappointed a lot of people. Um, and surprise a lot of people in that some of his economic policies are far-fetched. I mean, he's still so very nationalistic, so he's trying to really support the oil industry. But you may be familiar with, for example, you know, Mexico, the, the, his, his predecessor was halfway towards completing the construction of a brand new international airport, and he thought it was a waste of money. So he came into power and basically stopped construction of it and had another different one built. He's trying to build a train line that's going to go all through the, the Yucatan Peninsula. That's been a disaster. Like engineers, environmental activists are like, what are you doing? But surprisingly, the other thing that's really stunned a lot of people is the extraordinary amount of power he's given to Mexico's military. And that's extraordinary because Mexico was the one country throughout the whole 20th century where people never really had to worry about a military dictatorship. You know, one of the achievements of the revolution was to say the military is going to be apolitical, you're going to stay in your barracks and do what militaries do. You don't get involved in politics. And that's what, what happened. Now, suddenly, here's this guy from the old ruling party comes in. And today, the military has been basically put in charge of national security. They've replaced the police, the National Guard. They're the ones going into you know, Ciudad Juarez, Tijuana, uh, rural Western Mexico, um, fighting the war against drugs, but also picking up a lot of other people. And Mexico's experienced you know, tens of thousands of people have disappeared and died over the last decade, and a lot of them is widely believed at the hands of the military. So um, I applaud those teachers now Union Local for, <laughs> for being astute enough to kind of uh, turn against him. Um, and it's going to be very interesting to see what happens going forward, because of course in Mexico you have six years, one term, that's it. So it's going to be very interesting to see if his kind of chosen successor um, wouldn't, so right now that's widely believed in Mexico, his successor will be um, and this will be interesting. Um, um, she's the mayor of Mexico City. Her name is Claudia Scheinbaum. Um, she's a family. She's from a family of Lithuanian Jews. So she would be the first Jewish, uh, uh, for the first woman to be president of Mexico and also the first Jewish woman to be president of Mexico. Um, elsewhere in Latin America, um, you know, indigenous activism is widespread in Guatemala. Um, it's one of the reasons why they eventually bought uh, former General Rios Montt to, 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 on trial for, for genocide. Um, in Bolivia and Peru, 
there's been a lot of activism recently because in Peru, for example, where they deposed the guy who was elected president, surprisingly, he was a former rural school teacher of a partly indigenous background. He was deposed. He, he kind of carried out uh, what we might call a self-coup, <laughs> trying to close down Congress. And he was immediately arrested and deposed. But as some of you probably remember, over the last year, there was major mobilizations in rural Peru. Machu Picchu was closed down. And those were indigenous activists because they saw him as, as you know, one of them. Right. And so they become way more active. And, you know, today in places like Peru and Bolivia and Guatemala, um, politicians have to at least recognize you know, the indigenous people as as active citizens in a way that we probably have never really seen in, in the past. All right, thank you. See, it's getting uh, close to 8.30 here. Uh, Michael, if you maybe have one closing comment you'd like to make, and then we'll turn it back over to Betty. But, well, thank you all for being here. I see it's, it's a great audience. I see some former friends. I think I even saw one of my former students here, so it's nice to see that, that he's continued to be involved and in learning more about Latin America. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, uh, to share my, my knowledge and experiences with, with you all. So thanks for inviting me. All right. Well, thank you very much, Michael. And uh, Betty, you'd like to? Yes, thank you. Oh, Michael, it was fascinating. Thank you so much. I think we, uh, as Americans, we kind of take Latin America for granted because, well, I mean, we, we think we know about it because, well, it's our neighbors and we don't. I mean, it's, um, uh, and you take a look at the landmass of Brazil. I mean, it's huge. It's a large landmass, rivals the landmass of the United States. And um, um, there is, it's, um, it's, Fascinating. They are our neighbors. And of course, we've had a variety. I, it was interesting. I wonder if you were going to touch on some of the, the policies we've had with, with um, uh, Roosevelt's good neighbor policy. And what was Jack Kennedy's called? Um, John Kennedy's was um, the Alliance for Progress. The Alliance for Progress and all these attempts. And and uh, yeah, what a fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, I, I really enjoyed that. Um, Thank you. And next week. Join us, please. Um, we 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 tend to be a little bit flex more flexible with our dates than we have in years past because we uh, we uh, need to accommodate speakers and their schedules. And so we did a, a bit of a move. We have coming up in two weeks a, a distinguished speakers program. And by the way, there's the, the the name distinguished speaker and great decisions. People are like, what's the difference between the two names? Well, there's certainly no difference in the speakers because the speakers of both of these programs are absolutely outstanding. It's a great decisions program, comes with a name. And I think our council must have come up with the program called Distinguished Speakers, which has also been around for decades. Um, but we will be having the Irish Consulate out of Chicago join us. Um, this is the, uh, what is the, how many year, 30 year anniversary or so of the- um, 25th. Is it the 30th? 25th. 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 Okay, the Good Friday Accord that settled uh, the very, very long, bitter and violent uh, dispute between Northern Ireland and the Republic. Heard an interesting commentary the other morning that uh, only 10% of, of, of ch school children in Northern Ireland go to what is just a regular school. 90% of the children still go to um, a, a, uh, a parochial school, that a, a, a separation would mean a separation of religions. And so you have children still growing up this many years later, knowing very little and having very little integration with. And we just assume that it's all is copacetic and it's not. Uh, so you need to come back in two weeks and join us to find out. Uh, the, the Republic would like to be a unified Ireland. Northern Ireland is is uh, not so sure of that. So please come back and join us. It'll be very, very interesting because there's some rumbling going on in Ireland. I don't think that they're gonna see a civil war again, but there's rumbling going on. So come back and join us. Next week, um, um, uh, the Irish Consulate of Chicago. Next week, uh, we have a speaker from Purdue, Dr. Sylvia Border, who is going to be addressed the great decisions topic on global famine. And Purdue University is doing some outstanding things, just to cradle the astronauts because of its STEM programs. And of course, we also know it as an agricultural program, but they're doing way, way, way more than, I think I think Orville Redenbacher came out of Purdue University. And, and uh, Purdue, you know, so for those of you, I think that's pretty certain. So you'll never walk down the aisle of the popcorn aisle again and see it and not think about Purdue when you see Orville. 
But Purdue is doing so much more than just uh, coming up with wonderful ways to make popcorn. And, and I'm kind of anxious to hear it because um, Purdue is, has um, uh, really made significant inroads in addressing global famine. And I'll be very, very keen to hear uh, Dr. Border has to share with us next week. Um, and that will do it for April. Uh, we will, and when we meet again in a couple of weeks, uh, the week after next with the senior speakers, we'll talk about what will be our last program of the year in Great Decisions. But for now, we expect to see you to come back next week. Mary Lou, we hope you join us again from Pennsylvania. Global Famine will be a fabulous program. And then in two weeks, um, Irish Consulate to talk about uh, how shaky is the ground in Ireland. Uh, but they still have a Good Friday Accord. It's probably not going to change, but there, there's, um, there's some action going on. And of course, we know the president is there now. But uh, without further ado, thank you all for joining us very much. Uh, and again, Michael, thank you. It was a great thank program. You. Thank you very much.